sure it goes through now. The line drives, take up on the fly. You see how they're playing and what Gil wants. The glory and the excitement of Shea Stadium in summertime is where it's at for good times and good baseball. Far from the glamorous Big Shea, however, in wintertime, the quiet serenity of Al Lang Field in St. Petersburg, Florida is where it's at for dozens of aspiring future Mets stars spending a working winter. Conditions, and we got Billy Connors out here. Personalized coaching in all phases of the game, like hitting advice from full-time broadcaster, part-time batting instructor Ralph Kiner, might prove most helpful next season. Right there, and we get it here, and then we put it in the ball game. The New York Mets have been contenders two consecutive years after their championship season, and they're working the year round to return to the winning way. As the Mets battle back toward their number one perch, their loyal fans have never been dethroned. Once again, the Mets led the major league attendance figures with over 2,266,000 of the faithful spinning through the swirling turnstiles. And each one of those fans is quick to express his or her very own personal reasons for coming out to the big shade to see their Mets. Where else for Dallas there you can see such gorgeous people. Because I enjoy the Mets. You can't see her. The she had craved for. Because <laughs> I like the Mets. Because I love the Mets. But the food's good. Because I'm interested in baseball. I'm sure enjoy it. Send me out to do it with my mother and father. I want to see another miracle like 69. Vamos a hacer los campeones del 71. Eso es lo que yo pido. You got big in the mix? I love the mix. Big Tommy A.G. Meet a guy. Leon Jones. To get away from my mother. Tom Seaford. Well, my boy likes baseball. And all the mix. In 1971, the Mets finished tied for third in the National League East. Hard-hitting Tommy Agee and Cleon Jones led the offensive attack, but injuries plagued them throughout the year as they missed a combined total of 75 games. While healthy, Agee and Jones belted 14 home runs apiece. The fleet Mr. Agee went 28 for 34 in stolen bases in addition to his power hitting. Leon led the Mets average-wise, hitting a solid 319 after a slow start. The pitching staff had a big year, led by the amazing ERA and strikeout king, Tom Seaver. The defense was strong, buttressed by the steadying influence of the ever-spectacular Bud Harrelson at shortstop. Day in and day out, Harrelson was something special, making the tough plays look easy, en route to his well-deserved all-star status. Speaking of something special, there were some mighty special days at Shea for the Mets fans to enjoy that provided some memorable moments during the 71 season, like Banner Day, Hamlin Day, Bank Day, the Mayor's Trophy Game, Helmet Day. Family Day featuring Chris Gentry's fireballing. This is Joan Payson greeting the Cranepool family. Tommy Agee's new addition. And some daring base running by young Brian Dyer. Timer's Day, always a great attraction. Hall of Famer Satchel Page was a special guest. Joe DiMaggio and Casey Stengel visit with Mets manager Gil Hodges. The Mets skipper gets his turn at the plate and shows the fans his powerful swing is still a pitcher's nightmare. Old Satch takes the mound and shows him how. Timers game reaches back to the bitter Brooklyn Dodgers New York Giant rivalry. 20 years ago, Ralph Branca faced Bobby Thompson in the polo grounds with all the marbles at stake in the bottom of the ninth in the final playoff game. Branca 
After the shot heard round the world, Ralph Branca has lived with that haunting memory long enough, and he decides to switch roles with Bobby Thompson. A refreshing change of pace, but Thompson still comes out on top as Branca flies out to center. Spearheading the Mets' quest to return to the winning way is manager Gil Hodges. Supervising vigorous daily programs during spring training, Gill and his coaches work tirelessly with youngsters like Ken Singleton and Mike Jorgensen, hoping to build future winners to go along with proven commodities like Bud Harrelson. Hard work and concentration in the spring led a determined Bud Harrelson to his finest season and a place on the 1971 National League All-Star starting team at shortstop. It's always a thrill to play in an all-star game and of course I played in the 70 all-star game and I was fortunate enough to be in the starting lineup in the 1971 all-star game. I was able to go out there with players that I've seen play for many years, players like Mays and Aaron and McCovey and Torres and fellas that I think everybody respects around the league. I felt personally that I had every right to be there and, and it was one of the biggest thrills of my life just to take the field and be considered one of them. This winter, the Mets organization discussed Met All-Stars of the Future in Florida meetings held just prior to the draft, interleague trading, and the Winter Instructional League. General Manager Bob Sheffing, Director of Scouting Nelson Burbrink, and Director of Minor League Operations Joe McDonald preside over the SRO meetings of all scouting personnel. The topics included possible trades, promising youngsters, and the player draft. At Al Lang Field, Director of Player Development, Whitey Herzog held the reins. You ought to go into the ball when you catch it, Bill. See, you ought to go in another step, too. Uh, go one step right towards that runner before you break over. I didn't have the daylight. You got right oh, well, you got off the catcher now? Yeah. Okay. Under the expert guidance of Met personnel, no fundamental is left unturned as raw talent is turned up and tuned up for a shot at the big club next spring. Joe, take it, shot. And use this in a game. All right. Don't flick it now until you take one, one and a half steps in towards that runner, then flip your glove. And use it in a game they did, working the pickoff to perfection in an instructional league game. Shortstop at Shea seems a long way from Al Lang Field, but budding youngsters like Johnny Busco will give it their all in an effort to be the future Bud Harrelsons for the New York Mets. The World Series is my goal. It's my ambition. Uh, that's what I think is the... Uh, the highest point or zenith of anybody of any player's uh, ambition in life is to be in the World Series. My goal really is to play in as many World Series as I can and not just remember one series. Although it will not be forgotten because it was the biggest single thing and most important thing that happened in my life at the time. However, I don't think anyone should be satisfied with just one World Series or just one All-Star game. To return to championship form, the Mets are on the lookout for the consistent long ball. So necessary to break up those tight National League East pitching duels against the mound aces who keep challenging the hitters day after day. They're hoping Mike Jorgensen might provide a pleasant surprise. Mike showed promise last season and took a special course from Ralph Kiner this past winter in St. Petersburg. Well, the whole theory, you got two-fifths of a second to get that ball from the pitcher. You got to determine in two-fifths of a second the ball going about 85 miles an hour. You got to determine determine whether it's a fastball, curveball, whether it's a strike, a ball, a changeup, and whether or not you're going to swing and how you're going to swing at it. After showing occasional swinging power at Shea, Mike Jorgensen went directly to the winter instructional league to gain valuable experience. I never had the opportunity myself to play in the instructional league, but for a young player that is not able to play in as many games as the organization wanted him to play in during the season, can go there and get special instructions that I feel uh, he can't get while he's in the minor leagues. Usually the player that the 
is sent there for instructions or our fellows that uh, different organizations or the Mets feel that the, by going there they'll increase their chances of making it to the major leagues before they really expect to. Experience is exactly what the Mets feel will do the trick for young players like Tim Foley and Ken Singleton. Singleton has the potential to do it all. And the Mets hope experience and a winner cram course will help him reach the stardom he's capable of in short order. Once again, Professor Kiner got the call. Okay, Ken, you know, the basic thing that we talked about was you got to get the knee comes into here and you got to get the weight off this side and turn up here like that, which opens up your hips and allows your hands to work through. And then we're, of course, working again on setting that bat up off your shoulder so you won't drop your hands. And then the third thing I think that we should be working on is making sure that when you get out into here, the extension of your arms completely out. So uh, just give me a practice swing on that same basic theory there and go from there. Yeah, just like that. And then it's just a matter of repetition and doing it in batting practice. We've been using the hitting cage out there. Now the hard part is to take it from the hitting cage, put it in here against pitching, which uh, separates the men from the boys. Singleton slammed 13 home runs in 1971 in less than 300 official at-bats. He also led the team in walks and tied Cleon Jones for the team lead at most game-winning runs batted in at nine. Another fine prospect, Teddy Martinez, came up late in the season and looked like a good bet for the future. The speedy Martinez had a strong 288 and went six for six in the stolen base department. Wayne Garrett spent the better part of the 1971 campaign in the armed forces and didn't return to the diamond until August. Red looks forward to a full season in 72. Tim Foley just turned 21 years of age in the offseason. Another speedster, Foley went five for five stealing and comes into his sophomore season with confidence. Don Hahn is not noted for his hitting, but he was a valuable addition to the Mets outfield. Coming to the Mets in a trade for Montreal, Hahn carried one of the surest gloves in all of baseball. Hahn's bare hand was busy too, showing Mets fans a rifle arm with a knack for gunning opposition runners down on the bases. Ed Cranepool had his most productive year as a Met. He tied Jones and Agee for the club lead in home runs, while hitting a steady 280 with seven game-winning RBIs. Rainpool had the best fielding average among National League first basemen, handling 947 chances with only two errors at amazing 998 for the year. Second baseman Ken Boswell was another Met hampered with injury problems. Nonetheless, Boswell sparkled in the field and hit a respectable 273. Bud Harrelson had himself a year. Mr. All-Star shortstop is the perennial Golden Glove. At the plate, Bud led the Mets in triples and had eight game-winning runs batted in. On the bases, he was a blistering 28 for 34, tying him with Tommy Agee for the season. The Mets running game was a dandy, with a good touch at picking up the extra base at opportune moments, and 89 stolen bases. With Martinez, Boswell, Foley, Harrelson, Jones, and Agee, the major contributors. 
On the other side of the coin, Jerry Grody was a menace to the enemy running game. Grody's quick release and strong arm kept opposition base runners honest throughout 1971. Jerry continues to be recognized as one of the best defensive catchers in all of baseball. This banner was not at Shea Stadium in 1971. It will make its debut in 72. Acquired from the California Angels in an off-season trade, Jim Fregosi will fill the bill at third base and add hitting punch to the Mets lineup. Coming off an injury riddle season, Fregosi hopes to return to the all-star form that made him one of the most sought-after players on the trading market this past winter. Hitting for a high average and with power, the Shea Power Alley should suit Jim Fregosi just fine. Baseball is a game of inches. During the course of 1971, there were some good breaks, some bad ones, and maybe the law of averages is the great equalizer in the long run. is the heart of the Mets, there's Tom Seaver, Jerry Kuzman, Gary Gentry, Ray Sadecki, the promising potential of John Matlack. In Gil Hodges' opinion, Tug McGraw was the number one left-handed relief pitcher in baseball with 11 wins, 8 saves, and an incredible 1.70 earn run average. Danny Frisella, Gill's number one right-handed relief pitcher, with 8 wins, 12 saves, and a fantastic 1.98 ERA. Yeah. How would you the long man in the bullpen, Charlie Williams, gets sage advice from Mets coach Joe Pignatano while the game is in progress. The best. That's right, he does. The best way to get him is get ahead of him downstairs. Yeah, he'll try to go to the right field all the way with two strikes. Pitch story consistently inside all day, though. He'll hurt you with the ball in and up. 
free-swinging Roberto Clemente of the world champion Pittsburgh Pirates can hurt you no matter where the ball is thrown. But the Pirates with Clemente and the Cardinals with Torrey were unable to contain the Mets as the New Yorkers captured both season series from the two teams that finished in front of them in the National League East standings. The Cubs, led by Cy Young Award winner Ferguson Jenkins, were the only Eastern Division team to top the Mets in head-to-head -head competition in 1971. Cy Young Award or not, how can any pitcher have finer credentials than Tom Seaver? I really feel it, and I'm sure a lot of people agree that Tom is the best pitcher in baseball. I like other pitchers in the league, and I just think that Tom is smart, smarter than most pitchers, and uh, he's young in years as far as experience, but he's old in experience as long as knowing the hitters and knowing what uh, he can do and what he can't do. When he's asked the question, who's the best shortstop, naturally he says, uh, Bud Harrelson. On the last day of the season, Seaver faced the St. Louis Cardinals in search of his 20th win and a new National League strikeout record for right-handed pitchers. When Lou Brock struck out to open the game, it indicated a trend for the rest of the evening. Signed, go out, Seaver into the windup. And the pitch to Melendez. Fastball, strike three, called, and Seaver has a brand new National League record. 284 strikeouts for the season, a Met record, and a National League mark by right hand pitchers. And it's acknowledged on the scoreboard here, and that gets a standing ovation for Tom Seaver. But the score was still nothing to nothing until Ken Singleton hit a bases empty home run to give Seaver a 1-0 advantage in the fifth inning. In the sixth inning, the Mets broke loose for five runs. Cleon Jones ripped a double up the right center alley. Ken Singleton smashed his second home run of the night. And Tim Foley knocked in two more runs with a base hit to left, giving Tom Seaver more than enough breathing room, even though the Cards spoiled his shutout in the eighth inning. Seaver trying for his 20th win, his 21st complete game. And the pitch. Fly ball into the air to deep left field. Back goes Cleon. He is in red waiting. The game is over. And Tom Seaver pitching brilliantly. A 20-game season, 289 strikeouts, and an unbelievable 1.76 earned run average made 1971 a year to remember for Tom Seaver. What about 1972? That's a year the New York Mets look forward to with eager anticipation. A healthy Tommy A.G., Jerry Kuzman, and Cleon Jones continued outstanding performances from Tom Seaver, Bud Harrelson, Jerry Grody, Tug McGraw, and Danny Frisella, the addition of Jim Fregosi, and the improving young up-and-comers give the Mets all expectations of flying high. Thank you.